It is Tuesday, the 8th of October 2013, and this is the BBS News World. I am Onel Sanford Bell. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. A four year old narrowly escaped death after ingesting a toxic substance. Now, members of the child's family who say he was in the company of other children when the incident happened want some answers. And they are calling on the police to provide them those answers after a thorough investigation. DBS's Cicillactyl begins our news coverage tonight. The incident occurred in an area in Pebush, Babono. Family members say that the children were away from home somewhere nearby in a bushy area playing. They say another young boy who was in the company of the 12 and 4 year old sounded the alarm. My son came home with my little brother and his arm crying. Say the child can't walk and get the child in the mother house. When we check, we see a little light on full of poison in it. When they think we brought biotin or milk for the child to drink and we called the ambulance for him. The child is in VPT hands right now. We want the police to take the matter serious because the child is rejoicing what he's doing. Family members say that the four-year-old boy was hospitalized after drinking the substance and according to his mother, luck was on their side. They get the poison and they sit down, they don't do nothing. I want that, I want that right. The stepmother of the 12-year-old boy, in whose company the other children were at the time of the alleged poisoning, says she has not been visited by the police. The children were apparently left alone at her home when the four-year-old boy fell ill. Since police involved already in that matter, they have, the police have to come to me to let me know what's going on so that I could handle it by myself. But if no police never come to me and tell me anything, I leave it unto them. But how do you feel about the matter? Are you sorry that that, that, that happened? What, what, how do you feel? Well, the child is my brother. It happened to. So I'm not pleased as it happened to him. He told me he never gave the child any poison. All where he met the child is under the bush at the back then the child was crying. So he picked, take the child and bring the child here. And the child asked for water, so he give the child the water. And it's the, the child's parents and grandparents who accuse him and say he will give the child a poison. The father and grandmother of the child who ingested the toxic substance wants the matter to be thoroughly investigated. They have to go to court, they have to bring me up for that. So they have to go for that for that. It's not me, it's them. But you're the father? Yeah, but it's them. They have to take step for, for the child. The incident occurred in August. Reporting for the DBS News World, I am Cecil Actil. The Ministry of Health has put the country on high alert for dengue fever and is reporting one suspected death from the disease. The suspected victim is a child. The island's chief medical officer summoned a news conference today to express concern about the increased vulnerability of St. Lucians to dengue fever. DBS's Kendall Burton was there and filed this report. According to the chief medical officer, while the dengue fever is endemic to St. Lucia, meaning there are cases year-round, the rainy season usually sees an increase in reported cases, and this season has been no different. Already September has seen a spike in numbers with at least one suspected death reported. While the victim, a child in this case, did have a pre-existing medical condition which may have contributed to the death, the ministry is awaiting confirmation from tests done in Trinidad and Tobago. So far we are noticing quite a few cases of dengue. Most of them are mild, um, fever, joint pains, headache, and most persons are having a full recovery. However, persons should note that we have been having dengue fever for a number of years, and there are four serotypes, four different types of dengue. And usually when a population such as in the Caribbean has been exposed to the dengue virus for so long, our risk of developing more severe complications of dengue. Dr. Frederick says because St. Lucia has had cases of all four strains of the disease, the population is very vulnerable to dengue. However, persons with other medical conditions such as cancer and diabetes are especially vulnerable. The officer in charge of the epidemiology unit, Neham Jabatiste, says that concern also extends to children and the elderly. According to him, apart from Mikud, every other part of the island has reported cases of the disease. 
Data recorded over the past six years show castries, Viewfort and Grosilie reporting particularly high incidences of dengue fever. We saw we had in 2008 108 cases of dengue, followed by 17 in 2009, 93 in 2010, 758 in 2011. So, all, so we saw a huge outbreak of dengue in 2011 and that's this, the blue graph here and those are just the fever. And what we find is, what we have found is as long as the fever goes up, it's correlated to the dengue. We are, we, chances are we do also have dengue, and that's the reason why we are tracking the, the fever so, so close. When Gabriel, the chief environmental officer, says the ministry is employing a number of strategies to tackle the problem. We conduct what we call larviciding operations where we treat the aquatic stage of the mosquito. You would be aware that the mosquito uh, life cycle comprises of four stages, the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. So we target um, the, from the egg, the larva, and the pupal stage of the mosquito. Why? Because it's effective to do so uh, in that it is not m m mobile as the adult mosquito. So it's a sitting target. Other methods used to target and control the disease carrying Aedes aegypti mosquito include fogging and an aggressive public education campaign. Field surveillance exercises help health officials to track changes and to interact with residents. Unfortunately, Mr. Gabriel says, with the latest data showing increases anywhere between 20 and 80 percent, the time may have come for a review of existing practices and actions in order to register greater success in combating the disease. For the DBS Newsworld, Kendall Burton reporting. The St. Lucia Fire Service has put transporters of petroleum products on notice to take all necessary precautions against spillage. This after an oil spill on the Millennium Highway during the weekend. DBS's Jason Hollandseed reports. Fire service officials say that persons who usually transport oil need to be on guard. The oil spill on the Millennium Highway, which occurred just after lunchtime on Sunday, according to fire service personnel, could have spelled disaster for motorists. It's in that regard that transporters of oil and petroleum products are being cautioned. We are asking the public, whosoever is transporting any oil, whether it's sanitary workers or persons transporting oil, that they should be really careful knowing that the containers are properly covered. If not, they should, be, they, sh they should pack that vehicle and make sure everything is safe before continuing the, that, that transportation of oil yeah, because it could, it could pose a very dangerous threat and hazard to mot motorists and pedestrians alike. Mr. Solomon says oil spills on the island's roadways occur frequently. As a result, he says the St. Lucia Fire Service is usually the agency that's called upon to clean up afterwards. Regularly we um, have that maybe about once or twice week, twice weekly. Yeah, because we had a situation early on this morning in the Cicero entrance to uh, the Millennium. Yeah, we had an oil spill in this area, same location. It was, you know, a widespread area. Mr. Solomon says he is not sure what the penalty is for persons who deliberately don't adhere to normal procedure for transporting petroleum products. But he says every bit of caution should be taken to avoid spillage and the hazard it creates. For the DBS News World, Jason Hollandseed reporting. The St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association wants more citizens to get regular eye screening. As far as the association is concerned, persons appear to be putting more emphasis on other aspects of their health while neglecting their vision. The association is currently preparing to observe Thursday as World Sight Day. DBS's Kendall Burton has that story. Like other observances, such as Blindness Awareness Day, World Sight Day is designed to focus public attention on the importance of eye health. The theme for this year's observance is Get Your Eyes Tested. According to the Executive Director of the SLBWA, Anthony Avril, while people get regular medical and dental checks done, they are not as diligent in having their eyes tested. 
He is hoping that this week's observance will encourage equal importance to be given to eye health as to other aspects of health and well-being. With regard to eye health, it's not considered um, because it's not uh, considered to be a life-threatening um, uh, condition so that people are inclined to take their eye health for granted. But then we have seen enough in St. Lucia to know that eye problem is huge here, very, very big. I mean, we just have to remind people when um, they were lifting plain loads of, of, of persons from St. Lucia into Cuba. And, uh, and it has not been abated. According to Mr. Avril, persons above 30 should ensure that their eyes are tested at least once a year, especially if they have a family history of diabetes or glaucoma. But he is also concerned about the rising number of children suffering from vision problems, as evidenced by the growing number of patients treated at the Kids Inside Pediatric Eye Clinics. Mr. Avril is hoping to win the support of other medical professionals in encouraging patients to have their eyes checked as part of the annual physical. That is why among the many activities uh, down for throughout the month of October, Kendall, that we are uh, discussing with the appropriate um, institution a special campaign targeting medical professionals not involved with eye health. Um, we see them as very important in the uh, referral um, network, that they we want to ensure that they become a lot more aware of eye problems so that they will be able to refer and encourage their uh, patients to go and have their eye tested. As part of activities to mark World Sight Day and leading up to International White Cane Day on the 15th, the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association plans to air a film featuring several managers who consented to working blindfolded, sharing their experience of being temporarily blind. Reporting for the DBS News World, Kendall Burton reporting. A Bajan woman is now in police custody on suspicion of possession of marijuana with the intent of supplying the drug. The 24-year-old female was arrested at George F. L. Charles Airport on Sunday after police officers attached to the drug unit were summoned there by customs personnel. Information indicates that during a routine search of the young woman's luggage, customs personnel observed suspicious-looking packages concealed in a false compartment. According to the police, at the time, she was preparing to board a Liat flight destined for Barbados. Lawmen say a closer examination of the packages was done and plant materials suspected to be cannabis was observed. The Barbadian national was subsequently arrested and taken into custody for the offenses of possession of a controlled drug and possession with the intent to supply a controlled drug. Charges are expected to be laid against her shortly. And from that report to Street Vibes, for tonight's presentation, here is Alex Bousquet. Hi, I'm Alex Busque, and you're watching Street Vibes. Our question today is, do you think St. Lucians are health conscious? Nah, not at all. People just being inconsiderate and do not check on the health. To me, that's a very vital thing to do, and we should check on our health. Yes, as St. Lucian people. Not just St. Lucian people, but everybody. Yes, I do think St. Lucians are health conscious now that they have all those different pharmacies, the herbal shops and all those different places that would tell them, educate them, sensitize them as to how to use different products, especially the local products that we have from our great-grandparents, etc. Cochon, c'est number one by saint lucien Et c'est by, by Bella Condem. Et pour que tout le monde sait ça, il voulait. Donc, nous avons besoin d'un changement en pays. Pour que manger plus de fruitage. Et pour ces femmes, nous avons plus bas. Il est top go. Top bas, pas de, pas de. Tout bas, bon, pas bon, pas là. Bas, bas, bon, pas ça, pas avec moi. Je veux un monde slim. Et quand je suis jeune, je suis là, je suis là, je suis là, je You've just been watching Street Vibes of me, Alex Buske, down at the Aquarius Crossing. We're now taking you right back to our studio. 
Thank you, Alex. You're watching St. Lucia's News Leader and listening to us on Rhythm FM 95.5. We're also online and on the big screen at the Aquarius Crossing in downtown Castries. So to come in the DBS News World, the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce has hinted that taxes could have helped create an increase in unemployment. Consolidated Foods Limited and the YoPlay brand of yogurt have teamed up again in the battle against cancer. And Humilita Laporte is 103 years old and looking forward to celebrating her birthday again next year. The details are coming up. Please stay with us. Thank you for staying with the DBS News World. The St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce has hinted that taxes could have helped create an increase in unemployment. The Chamber of Commerce today joined the Employers' Federation in expressing concern about the latest jobless figures released by the Department of Statistics. Those figures suggest a 3% hike in unemployment. But according to the Executive Director of the Chamber, it should hardly come as a surprise because the private sector body had already forecast such a scenario. DBS's Kendall Burton explains. According to Brian Luizzi, the private sector has tried its best to avoid layoffs in the face of a protracted recession. But the worsening economic forecast has made streamlining a matter of course for many businesses and could mean the difference between them keeping their doors open and folding up their operations. People may recall that um, about four or five years ago, on the onset of the, um, the recession, the, the chamber and its membership did indicate that they would be seeking to retain employer, employment as best they could. They would not rush into a rash of um, layoffs. They would try to weather the storm. They would make the adjustments where possible. But one would appreciate that it has been quite a long um, period of, 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 of economic slowdown. And decline, and so um, I think we're seeing the natural effects of wear and tear on the economy and businesses who have held out for a long period, and things are not turning out to be better. Things are not improving. Redundancies, Mr. Luizzi says, are a natural consequence of doing business in the midst of a drawn-out recession. He is hopeful, however, that even in the face of the economic crisis, some businesses may find opportunities for expansion, investment, and new business prospects. While not explicitly supporting claims by some that the implementation of VAT may have contributed to the situation, he says the negative impact of the tax across sectors cannot be denied. I believe um, VAT has had a number of um, effects and has um, caused a change in behavior um, in a number of um, sectors, a number among, among, among a wide cross section of the population. Um, the chambers of the view that um, the manner in which that was implemented um, may have caused and contributed to some negative repercussions. Like the Employers Federation a week ago, Mr. Luizzi says the chamber is open to any discussion on issues of national economic development, including the current unemployment problem. He is hopeful that the launch of the National Productivity Council here next week will be a good springboard from which to begin that discussion. For the DBS News World, Kendall Burton reporting. Thank you, Kendall. Teachers Week came to an end on Sunday with a teacher's rally at Spinners in Union. The event emphasized the importance of delivering quality education to the nation's children. DBS's Don Nicholas tells us more. The rally was held under the theme Quality Education for Global Citizenship. During the course of the activity, Regional Coordinator for Education International, Virginia Albert Poyot, called on teachers to adopt the latest strategies to prepare students for life in St. Lucia and beyond. I have had the experience, and I must say, thanks to the St. Lucia Teachers Union for affording me the opportunity to make a contribution, not just in St. Lucia, but in the wider Caribbean and the world at large. And these are the kind of examples that we expect from you. Do not expect yourself to be seated here in your classroom. You can go out there and make a change, make a difference. And I can assure you that SLTU is under the leadership, and I will keep Mr. Monroe's 
and Mr. Howell and the other members of the executive busy because they have to deliver and they have to ensure that we get quality education for our citizens in St. Lucia. Officials also called on the teachers to make good use of the technology available. Creating classrooms of digital, digital natives. If we do not use the technology, we'll be left behind. We will become digital immigrants. So we have to take advantage of the opportunities which come because it's the students in our care who are the beneficiaries. In St. Mary's and the Grandins, the government provided netbooks for primary school students from grade 2 to 6. President of the St. Lucia Teachers Union, Julian Monroe, spoke to the challenges facing the teaching profession. One of them, discrimination against female teachers. We were still fighting. Say, look, if every worker is allowed annual leave, every teacher gets annual leave between July and August. If a female teacher gets, gives birth in July or August, that teacher loses the annual leave. We were saying that cannot be. It is not right. It's discrimination against the female teacher. And sometimes I fought this fight wondering if I was a woman, you know. <laughs> but today, I can announce that the Ministry of Education has agreed with us that female teachers who give birth in July or August will get the 13 weeks maternity and the 7 weeks vacation. Teachers say they plan to continue working with the Ministry of Education and other players to improve the quality of education on the island. Teachers Week is held annually to celebrate the achievements of those employed in the teaching profession, to reflect on their contributions and to plan to deal with the current and emerging challenges confronting teachers. For the DBS News World, I am Don Nicholas reporting. And CIBC First Caribbean held its annual fun walk on Sunday in support of cancer. Yours truly was a part of that event. And DBS's Jason Hollenseed has that report. The annual walk for the cure of cancer was started some 18 years ago by parent company CIBC. Officials say the activity was about sensitizing people to cancer and supporting the battle against the disease in the region. Last year, CIBC raised $3 million for that, towards that cause. In the region, CIBC First Caribbean last year raised $30 million, EC dollars. 30,000, sorry, 30,000 U.S. dollars through contributions made by staff and their loved ones. So far this year, we've doubled that amount to 60,000 U.S. dollars, thanks to the contribution of our staff, and like I said, the family, their friends. We started from here, Bridgefield Branch, we walked through uh, Fuasho into Millennium Highway, down into Cul-de-Sac, in the junction of Cul-de-Sac going into Bexon, and we return via the same route. CIBC First Caribbean partnered with the group Faces of Cancer and the Cancer Society to host the event, which was considered a success. Participants see the walk was one with meaning. My brother was diagnosed with cancer when he was 23 years old, but he's alive and well today because of good people like this raising money to contribute to the cause and improve the care for people suffering with cancer. So. I'm um, happy to do my little part. Being someone who lost my mom, my mom through cancer, I've always felt as if I, I must support something of that initiative. At least 100 persons came out in support of the walk. For the DBS News World, Jason Hollandseed reporting. Thank you, Jason. In related news, Consolidated Foods Limited and the YoPlay brand of yogurt have teamed up again in the battle against cancer. Today, they launched the Save Lids to Save Lives campaign and YoPlay Walk for Cancer 
to raise awareness and much-needed funds for breast cancer. Over the past five years, campaigns, the campaigns have helped to raise over $120,000 to support the institutions that assist women affected by the disease. This year's theme is I Pledge, and the public is being invited to help the cause. Your play is taking the message of breast cancer awareness on the road across St. Lucia during this Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The brand has organized a walk to raise awareness of breast cancer in St. Lucia and also to remember those who lost their lives to the disease. This year, the St. Lucia Tourist Board is supporting the event for the first time. While the campaign is presented and managed by Uplay and CFL, we have been able to successfully incorporate various stakeholders to further grow the walk in particular. I am therefore pleased to inform that this year we have entered into a partnership with the St. Lucia Tourist Board. This partnership will enable us to broaden our base to include persons visiting the island for the annual St. Lucia Health and Wellness Retreat, which is organized by the board. And in fact, we are leveraging the promotional machinery of one event in support of the other. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the campaign is growing. The funds raised from the Uplay sale and the walk will go to the National Community Foundation, which is an NGO set up to provide assistance to needy persons in areas such as medical and other expenses. No longer does, does this dreaded disease affect postmenopausal women. Rather, many of the women who are now affected by cancer and who come to the N NCF are still in the prime of their lives with young children and also actively involved in the labor market. And it is for this reason that the NCF and CFL are very concerned about the impact of breast cancer. The funds from last year's walk went towards treatment for nine women affected by cancer. They ranged in age from 31 to 49 years. The money they received ranged from two to $5,000, depending on the nature of the case. Cancer survivor Dorothy Phillip told her story. The group is expanding very quickly as we have seven new people diagnosed with cancer every week in St. Lucia. And um, people cannot afford the cost of exorbitants and it's, it's a very hard time for breast cancer survivors. Um, stress is not something that, can, that breast cancer people can do away with because there's so many, you, you tend to think of where am I getting the money? We know it's a lot of money. Um, a lot of times we know we will not be able to afford the treatment. So although stress is not good for cancer, how do you tell somebody don't stress out when they need $150,000 just to stay alive? The walk is in its fifth year. Last year, the event raised $32,000. Reporting for the DBS News World, I am Cecil Actil. Patrons and caretakers of the Marian Home came together today in celebration of Humilita Laporte's 103rd birthday. Miss Laporte is from Soufre and is now the only survivor of nine siblings. My name is Rolf Stanislaus and uh, I am the husband of Humilita's grand niece. And uh, we live in, in the United States, and uh, she is currently here at the Marian home. My sister, Royce Stanislaus, helps us with her whilst we are in the United States. But we have come down here to celebrate her 103rd birthday. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I've got a philosophy that when we are born, God punches our ticket, and we know it, he knows exactly when it's time for us to go. Her time has not come, and we, all of us, need to celebrate whatever time that we have with her because God alone knows when her ticket will be punched. She is from Sufre. Uh, she began her career as a teacher in the Sufre Girls School, and uh, she moved on to be the librarian at Sufre for 45 years and then she retired and she's been home in Soufre. We had people taking care of her but now we have no one taking care of her. We had to move her to the Marian home. But she had a brilliant career as a librarian. 
Miss Laporte was never married and has no children of her own, but is said to have scores of godchildren and has adopted two of them. Today, Humilita Laporte expressed full confidence in her longevity because she has invited our camera crew to her next birthday celebration. That's the way to go. In other news, the Trinity Lutheran Church celebrated the acquisition of a new building and a preschool with a Thanksgiving exercise at Bizet this morning. DBS's Cicilacto was there. A tree signifying a celebration of Thanksgiving. The Trinity Lutheran Church has now established a permanent presence in Bizet and in addition to providing religious services, also operates a preschool for toddlers in the community. The tree was planted on the church property in thanksgiving for the preschool and in celebration of the mission of the religious organization. It was part of our planning when the preschool opened. On the 2nd of September, we decided to plant the tree in a month's time as thanksgiving for our opening of this part of our ministry of the church. So we planned that like one month ago as in, to collaborate with the Thanksgiving of the country too and Thanksgiving of our church and school. The preschool was opened on September 2nd. The church first opened its services 20 years ago at the Vidbute School. But last year it managed to construct its own building. God has given us so much growth with a, you know very few members and we've been saving up for 20 years for enough money for a loan for this building and um, now we open the preschool and so we're celebrating the blessing that God has given us. Um, so much growth with so little resources. The tree planting activity took place at BZ Tuesday. Reporting for the DBS News World, I am Cecil Actil. Senior citizens at the Marian Home were treated to a special lunch on Sunday to mark Elderly Care Day. They also enjoyed live music provided by Jim Coco Snow. Today is Elderly Care Day and here at the Marian Home we decided to entertain the residents. We have realized that um, they, they love musical entertainment, so as a result we have Coco here with us celebrating and uh, entertaining them musically. Um, also, we decided that we would uh, cook up something special for them uh, with a little dessert after to celebrate the day. Uh, we appreciate very much you know, being able to do this kind of thing for the citizens here in St. Lucia, the elderly. And uh, we hoping that the service we offer here for the elderly will not be in vain, but that you know, we can celebrate as well and uh, have them have a good time um, and not think that you know here is a place where you just come and uh, spend the last days and, and that's it. You know, we want to be able to um, provide for them holistically as well. Every year for elderly we'll do it and, and when we do it also on Christmas time and probably any little, little festivity we get we, and um, Creole, the Creole day as well, you know, so we can, you know, just to make them feel happy and comfortable. According to the organizers, senior citizens at the Marian Home thoroughly enjoyed the activity. When the DBS News World continues in this joint transmission with Rhythm FM 95.5, banana farmers say their livelihood is being threatened by the entry of large players into the fair trade market and thousands celebrate Oktoberfest. The details are coming up right after this break. Please stay with the broadcast. Thank you for staying with the DBS News World. I'm Onel Sanford Bell. In more news, banana farmers in the fair trade movement believe they are under threat from the entry of larger players in the fair trade market. The director of the Windward Islands Farmers Association, Renwick Rose, says the larger players are creating more competition for the already embattled small producers. Mr. Rose was addressing hundreds of fair trade supporters and campaigners at the Kensington Town Hall in London last week. They were attending the 2013 Fair Trade 
Supporters Conference. Mr. Rose told the gathering of the need for frank discussion on issues affecting small producers so that the integrity of the fair trade label can be protected. He also called for what he described as new re-engagement and recommitment on the part of the Fair Trade Foundation of the UK and UK supermarkets to transform the agriculture industry in the Windward Islands. Thousands celebrated the official start of Creole Heritage Month on Sunday when Oktoberfest on Creole got on the way. DBS's Jason Hollandseed was there and has this report. Hundreds gathered at Salmon's Park on Sunday afternoon to experience Oktoberfest on Creole. The annual event in its sixth year saw record numbers jump-starting Creole Heritage Month which is currently being observed. I think we've always had, I think this year we could simply say we had an Oktoberfest at its full potential. Um, previously, we've had rain, it, it, and the good thing is it's never rained out, but rain has always affected the full attendance of Oktoberfest. But this year we cannot complain about the rain we had. I mean, we had the best weather you could ever ask for to host such an event. So I think from that standpoint, it is key. Second thing, it's always an innovation. We always need to put new bears. The only bear that remains on our, in our portfolio is the traditional or the Polana bear, which is the official October bear. Persons demanded the Pablo, so we brought it back again. Mr. Harry says the event has grown tremendously over the years. He says the engine behind the event, Winwood and Leeward Bury, plans to keep October 1st as a staple on the island's calendar and grow the activity further. For patrons, it was all about the food, and for some, sampling the wide range of bears from around the world. I'm having a great time. I'm enjoying all the bears. The music, the music is great. The best. The atmosphere is good, and I just like the way we look and enjoying ourselves. The band, the culture, the Creole music, and the band. It's wonderful. It's very nice. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying myself. That's once in a while. October first, a Creole also featured DYP and a host of national artists. For the DBS News World, Jason Holland Seed reporting. Thank you, Jason. On the lighter side tonight, well, adversity can forge some strange alliances. In this case, a rat hitched a ride on the back of a frog to get across a pond on the outskirts of northern India. As a result, the rat was saved from drowning. Photographer Azim Hussein watched as the two struck up an unlikely friendship. The frog dived into the water and his, with his new cargo on his back and slowly waded through the pond. The photographer says he managed to take a few photos and was fascinated with the way the frog swam and the rat held on tight. They were like friends, he said. The frog carried the little rat all the way to the shore offering him a new lease on life. However, the photographer lamented that he did not capture the moment when the frog reached the shore and the rat just sped away. Humans can take note. Brian Calix is next with sports. Don't go away.